Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so first I want to point out that this is work I've did together with two people at Uppsala, David Blackshaffer and Andreas Sembrandt. Um, optimization, that's what it says in the, in the title, you know, we're going to optimize something. So what is an optimization? Uh, in this case, for all the cache hierarchy, well, the optimizations are two things. First, you have to have some flexibility, which means you can either do this or that. And then you have to have some kind of heuristics that decides whether you should do this or that, right? And the outline of this talk is to first talk about a flexible architecture that gives you lots of different choices. So I'm going to talk about how the hardware is organized. It's going to scratch a little bit on classification, coherence, and determinism, but I'm going to try to leave as many details out as possible. Then we're going to talk about heuristics. If you have a flexible architecture, what kind of heuristics can you do to decide if you're going to do this or that? And what are the results of when you do this all together? And then at the tail end, I'm going to talk about some other usage areas of this, which are not that different from what Pat talked about. You know, I can actually help Pat implement his his data compression, and I can also build some very efficient DRAM caches. So memory has been, relatively speaking, be become slower and slower uh, over time. So uh, you know, about 60 years ago, uh, people figured out that it would be really good to have a cache memory sitting between memory and CPUs. And in order for the cache memory to work, you need some kind of metadata. And this is how a typical lookup lo uh, is, works out in the cache, you take a bit, some bits of the address you would like to access, you hash into uh, the cache and to identify the possible places where the data may be. This is a four-way set associative cache, so there are four different places. And there are also four uh, associated uh, metadata that comes with those places. And what you do is you take another part of the address and you compare that part to those address tags and you can figure out that the data is in, in one of those places. So in this case, the data is, is the rightmost data, we return it to the CPU. So in this example, it's a four-way set associative cache, but typically modern uh, caches are eight-way or, or 16-way or, or may even have even higher associativity. Um, so that was 60 years ago. What has happened uh, since 60 years, over 60 years? Well, we started to build deeper cache hierarchies. So we have more levels of caches. They are still uh, built the same way. You have some bit of metadata, which are the tags, and then you have the, the data part, the, the blue part. And if you like to access a piece of data, you go to the first level cache and you will search those eight or 16 address uh, tags to see if the data is there. If it's not, you go to the next level, next level. And at one point you will have to go across the network of chip to go to the other side of the world and there is the last level cache. And if you're lucky, it may be in the last level cache, specific place you determine the data. Sometimes uh, the cache coherence protocol will come to play and tell you you have to do a little cache coherence hanky pank. For example, the piece of data that we're look, looking for may reside in, a complete, in the private cache of another core. So that means we have to start to search that hierarchy backwards, upwards towards the core. It was not in the L2 cache. Let's look for it in the L1 cache. But unfortunately, just before our request uh, arrived at the L1 cache, that piece of data was kicked out. So we have a typical race condition that we have to deal with in cache coherence protocols, where the data we're searching for actually snuck out the back door and we never saw it. So, this is what we've been doing. So we implement caches with uh, tags in the form of address tags, and metadata in the form of address tags. So one of those address tags, typically 30 bits or so. Data and tags are fused together, meaning that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between a data in the blue part and its corresponding metadata. And that metadata answers a very local question. The question is, is the data here, full stop, okay? Um, this implies that we have to search a, a, a hierarchical topology level by level by level until we come to the root of the tree, and then we may have to search backwards again. So this means that we add latency, because every time we search for data, we add extra latency just to get the bad news. Uh, would it be much quicker if we'd gone maybe straight to LLC if we had known that the data was there? And also energy is consumed uh, for, for each level, each comparison, and also, not the least, going across that network on chip. So, um, 60 years of cache design, uh, same hierarchical uh, structure, same brute force searches. Um, this is very expensive for latency, it's also expensive for energy. Uh, so Mark Horowitz of Stanford, he published a paper where he analyzed where the power consumption is spent on a multi-core chip, and his conclusion was about half of the energy is spent in the memory hierarchy, about half is spent in the cores. 
So expensive searches, that's what we have, hierarchical topology, and a, a very complex cache clearance protocol with lots of corner cases. Are there other ways we can organize this metadata to get rid of this? Why, who says that the metadata of a cache has to be an address tag? So that's the question we asked us ourselves when we came up with this idea that we uh, sort of, a, we call it green cache as, 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 an, um, as a collective name for uh, several papers that has been published. Before I tell you about green cache, I just have to warn you, if you're a hardware designer, this is gonna look very scary because it doesn't look the way you're, it, it's used to look. And that's the whole point. That's why we do this, right? If you're a software person, you're gonna stare at this and say, ah, I thought that was implemented like this all along. Why, why, why haven't people done this earlier? And our answer to that is, well, don't blame us. We did this, we thought of this as fast as we could, okay? <laughs> so, so the green idea is, is very different, but not necessarily more complex, just because it's different. And we actually claim that it's, it's much, much simpler to implement. So we've been developing this over uh, five years in, in research. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about here is a paper we published last year in HPCA, mostly, so if you're interested in some of the details I'm glossing over here, you can find them there. But also, like Pair, we have a, we have a startup company, Green Cash, uh, that has been interacting with industry over, over five years to get feedback on which direction we, sh we should move the architecture, to get feedback on which are the interesting questions. But also, we've had some real industri industrial strength evaluation of this technology. So what I'm telling you here, as well as in the research paper, may not be the full story. There is a little bit of a secret story here that can't, can't be told. Okay, so green cache, I said we have new kind of metadata. So our metadata is a smarter kind of metadata. It, it answers a global question. It answers the question, where is the data, not is the data here? So we store this data in the metadata storage, and the, the metadata itself is organized in what we call cache line pointers. So here you have a cache line pointer in the metadata storage saying this piece of data is in the last level cache and in associative way in number five. That's actually all you need to know, know to be able to access that piece of data. The problem is that this metadata storage is so far away from the cores that they, they, they would take a long time for them to first go to the metadata storage and then go to where this data is, is located. So what do architects do? Well, architects, they're not very innovative. We always solve everything by introducing caches. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce a new set of caches. By, by the way, that's the master copy of the cache line. That's the, the cache line copy that if the data is not in your cache, that's where you turn to, to get your, your copy of the cache line. So we introduce a new kind of hierarchy called the metadata hierarchy, where we have puny little caches, and those caches cache metadata. So we cache metadata information in this. So for example, so we just do, think of this just as normal caches, we spill and fill data. So if uh, the core to the right wants to access a piece of data, it can cache the corresponding metadata that says the data is in LLC way five. And it, given that information, it can skip all these searches and go directly there and just get the data. These pointers are quite small. So you can, in the size of systems I'm gonna talk about here, you can encode that pointer in five bits. And I'm gonna show you the tail and exactly how the encoding is done. So it's much smaller than the address tags, and it answers the global question instead of a local question. When we do the comparisons uh, with our system, compared with, with existing systems, we always do area neutral uh, studies. So we don't need the address tags that you have to the left. So we use all the SRAMs that used to be, so it, that today are used to implement this, the, the tag storage as well as the directory storage, and we invest them in metadata storage at the same level. level. Just so we can compare apples and apples. This may not, as, not necessarily be the most efficient way to, to or, uh, configure our system, but that's, it, at least it's a, it's a fair, fair comparison. So an interesting thing to note as well that the, the cache, metadata cache hierarchy, is a hierarchy of normal caches, while the blue part of this picture, the, the blue cache storage is just SRAM. If you have a pointer, and you can access, take that point and you can go to an SRAM that you have all the information you need to, to do a lookup. There are no comparators or anything like that, no extra metadata, just the blue blob. So that could be SRAM, it could be DRAM, could be anything. Yeah. Okay, so that pointer can, for example, point to uh, a private cache like L2, uh, can po point to LLC as we saw before on the other side of the network on chip. It can have a symbol there saying memory which means the metadata promises that this data is not cached, 
So it knows you know right away you have to go to memory, so you don't have to spend time and energy to search your, your cache hierarchy at all. If the data is located in another core's private caches, the metadata will not point to exactly that location. Instead, it will point to that core saying, I know for sure that that core uh, has the piece of data. Go and ask that core for where it is. At this point in the talk, I know of get questions, especially from the hardware people, not so much from the software people. Um, so what, I mean, how can you, this metadata the information, how can you keep it, can you keep it in sync? Is everybody pointing to the same place? How can you move data around? And actually, it is, it's very much in sync. So we implement a, a property called determinism that guarantees that the metadata, you, if you read the me metadata from your metadata cache and it points to a spe specific location in the cache, we guarantee that the data is still in that location where when your request reaches that cache. So it's called determinism. So that means we avoid lots of the typical race conditions you have in, in multi-core systems. Do you need two protocols, one for blue data and one for this metadata cache? It, actually, it's a single protocol. And as I said, we remove uh, many of the typical corner cases from that. Doesn't it increase traffic? Uh, actually, overall, uh, it, the, the amount of network on chip traffic is decreased by 70% uh, using this protocol. So what's the big deal? We have three things. One is that we avoid the searches. Okay? That probably intuitively sounds, feels like a good idea to you. Uh, but we have two other properties that are maybe even more important. We have a shared and private classification uh, of regions I'm gonna talk about, but most of all flexibility. If you have a pointer saying, it, I know it's in cache number 64 uh, in wave four, that means that the, you can implement any topology. I mean, you don't have to have a hierarchy. I mean, that, that spe special cache may be in the corner over there. It may, it may be in a completely different building. Well, I, I don't know, but you can, you know, build very, very flexible topologies uh, given that. And that's what, what, what will give us actually most of the benefit of this. So expensive searches are gone, hierarchical topologies are gone, and the complex protocol uh, are, are gone with this. So let me show you a couple of slides of how we organize the metadata, because this may sound a li little bit like hocus pocus. Um, so, um, um, so metadata here uh, in the metadata cache, saying that the data, data is an LLC way five, uh, turns out that we don't uh, store metadata once uh, in, in, in by themselves. We always store metadata in collection of with, with their 15 friends, okay? So we store 16 uh, of these cache lines, uh, metadata, um, metadata information for 16 cache lines together in one bucket. And we call that bucket a region. So that's what's been, been the or, how we organize the metadata at, at the top level there. So we have uh, a physical address tag because it's a cache. So we need to have some address tag, but we amortize it over 16 cache lines. We need to have the 16 cache line pointers, and then we have a very important piece of information called the tracking bits. So the tracking bits tells which of the four cores in this, this example that is tracking the location of, the, of, of this region. So which of these cores actually have cached metadata in the metadata caches? Because if, you don't, if they don't have data in the metadata caches, they can't access any of those 16 cache lines. So in this example, none of the cores actually have cached th this metadata information. Uh, so we know these 16 cache lines uh, can't possibly be accessed by anybody. And at the point in time where the first core uh, uh, makes an access to this region, we cache that information and we change the, the tracking bits to reflect the fact that that core uh, is now has has a copy of the metadata and therefore can also access the, metadata, uh, access the cache line. So the cache metadata looks very much the same. Uh, we have a virtual address tags, but then we also have 16 cache line pointers and we have a private bit. So we don't have the tracking bits. We just have a private bit and that private bit is set if we know that this is the only core that may access the data. So this is simply just do some kind of reference count for people who implement um, uh, garbage collectors, for example. You know, of course you need reference count to figure out what's going on, how many people are pointed to my data structure. Uh, so same thing here, we just count how many bits are set or those, those tracking bits and we can figure out if this is a region that can't be accessed by anybody, can access by, access by exactly one, or can it be accessed by more. So untracked, private, and shared. So we have virt uh, virtual address tags close to the cores. We have physical address tags uh, further away from the core. Um, this speeds up the core access 
on the top end, and it also allows to implement traditional uh, coherent shared memory uh, physically uh, addressed at, at the very bottom. Okay, um, so that was the structure. Uh, also, I have a few slides about cache coherence and determinism. Um, so, because it looks like it's going to be so complicated, it's going to take so much extra energy to keep coherence and also to keep all these pointers in sync. Um, so, the green cache coherence has been optimized for the common case. So, what is the common case in, in the cache coherence system? Uh, so, the common case it turns out to be just normal read accesses. So, out of all L1 cache misses, 81% of read accesses, and as you can already figure out, I have a deterministic pointer that I can guarantee points to exactly where the data is. I can, for this 81%, I can make the most efficient possible access. I just go to that location and it will return the data. There is no coherence involved. There is no directory updated or anything like that. Okay, so that's pretty good. Most common case didn't cost us anything, so it's much more efficient than traditional shared memory implementation. Uh, then you have rights to private regions, so that's another 10%. So what's a private region again? Well, that's a region when you access it, that private bit is set, telling you that you're the only one who can access this piece of data. That turns out to be a no-op as well when it comes to coherence, because if you know that you are the only one that can access the data, you can give yourself right permission without involving the directory or asking anybody else for permission, because you are the only one. So you yourself decide, I now can write this piece of data. So you just follow the pointer, get the data from LLC, and the data returned is writable if you want it, and you can just keep it as readable if you don't need the right access as well. So all that is left actually is 9% of the normal coherence activity in, in this system uh, for accesses which are writes and which are to shared regions. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a, a, a shared region. Um, so, so that's the only time that we have to access a directory to implement coherence. And in our case, the directory is actually the metadata at the top, top level. So we, the, that metadata is going to double as metadata storage, but also do the directory duties uh, for the cache coherence. So there you have the uh, structure again with the, the, the tracking bits. And since you can see here that the leftmost and the rightmost um, core both have are tracking this region. Um, the tracking bits will be 1001, so we know exactly which, which are tracking this. Um, the, so we have the two cache lines here, so they actually are, this is not just a shared region, it's also is, is a shared cache line. That's the master copy of the cache line. If anybody, uh, if any other core uh, wants to read, get the copy of the cache line, that's where they will turn. And you can see it's, it's a master copy because it's um, pointed to by, by uh, the top node here. While the node to the left is pointing to its own local copy, so this is a readable, both of these cache copies are readable copies of the same cache line, but the right one is the master copy. What happens now with those 9% of cases where you have read write accesses to shared regions is you send a write request to the directory. That's exactly how Per and I implemented cache coherence over the, the last 30 years or so. Uh, does that reveal our age if I say that? Um, and that means the directory will say, yeah, it's a write request. I have to send out some invalidates to, to the world to make sure that all those other copies are invalidated. So it sends out the invalidate request to all the other tracking cores. So left one, that's who sent the request. We don't have to send it to that, but we do have to send to the right one. Okay, so we send a normal invalidate request to, to the master. Happens to be to the right. And now the master will do three different things. In that normal cache coherence protocol, you will do two things you will invalidate the cache line, and you will send an acknowledgement back to the, to, the, uh, to the directory. In our implementation, we will actually perform three things. We will invalidate the cache copy, gone. We will change the cache line pointer to point to whoever is gonna have the next, be the next master of this cache line because it wants, it's a right request. It's gonna change the data. That's where the master is gonna be. And then we send an acknowledgement back. So in terms of coherence messages, this is as expensive or as cheap, depending on what your, your, your view of the world as traditional cache coherence protocols. Send and validate, do stuff locally, send an acknowledgement back. And the rest of this is the same kind of cache coherence protocol that, that we've been implementing over the last 30 years. So now everything is said and done, we have a new master. And so we have moved the master from the old place to, to the new place and also given that new master a uh, right permission. Okay, so that's simple. You know, we understand that pretty much how that works. The question is, how can I be so cocky and, and uh, claim that we have determinism in, in our uh, metadata? 
So in order to get determinism, you have to guarantee that if you read metadata from your metadata cache, it points somewhere, you have to guarantee the data is still there when the read request gets over there. So let's see, say now that the master copy uh, is uh, in the LLC, for example, and let's say the master copy is moved somewhere. How can the master copy get moved? Well, for example, somebody performs, sends a write request. That's a way to move the master copy to a new place, as we saw in the previous example. So let's say now that core to the left and core to the right both agree that the data is in LLC in a specific way. And let's say, say that uh, er, the core to the left sends out the write request, um, so it wants to get mastership, and pretty much at the same time, the uh, core to the right sends out a read request because it, somebody told him this was a deterministic protocol, you can trust this pointer, it's just gonna go out and read the data. It's not gonna uh, to try to validate whether this is the right data, it's gonna trust this pointer. Okay, so this is sc scary. There could be a little race here, which, which one which will happen first, you know? So for example, the invalidation of the write request may happen on its way to the core before the data has been returned to the core. So what would happen in, in our case is we will, instead of sending an acknowledgement back, as we did in the previous example, as soon as we get the invalidation request, uh, what we will do is to hold off sending off the acknowledgement. So this write cannot complete. We cannot move the master to the new place until the data has been returned. Okay, so we just simply delays, we delay sending the acknowledgement until it's safe to do so. If I have not send a read request, I'm not gonna acknowledgement any master changes until that data is back. And then you send the acknowledgement. And then you, 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 you change the pointer. So this is sort of a the delay the write request for, for when you do have ma master movements, when we detect those kind of possible write, write cases, and that's how we can implement the determinism. So one of the interesting properties that for people dealing with implementation of memory models is that that read request gets modeled, it gets ordered in the memory model, uh, memory model ordering as soon as you read the metadata from the metadata cache, okay? Not when the data is returned. So if you, if after a few cycles, get a pointer back from the, your metadata saying, I know this piece of data is in memory, you actually have bound that value. That value that is, is the memory right now is the one that will be returned. Nobody can change that. So in that sense, we actually order the memory, uh, the read request at that point in time. Of course, there are many details that I am uh, omitting here. Okay, so that's um, the, the determinist, uh, how the pointers work, cache coherence. We're just gonna look at the, the, the tail end of this, which I can tell you how we can get flexible architecture and add some heuristics to make this work really well. Um, so, so what we have so far is what we call direct to data. We, um, we rely on the property that the, you, know, you can use these pointers and go and get the data without having to search the cache hierarchy, so that's all good. That's what motivated us to start this work. So we show that in a, if you don't have a multi-core, you just have a single core. Uh, we show that 40% uh, um, um, lower access to your L2 cache, thanks to this, and you have uh, you know, between five and 17% lower cache energy, depending on what the applications which you're studying, so you get a little bit of saving. Um, so the advantage we've seen so far, no searches, that's pretty good. Cl private classification, that's good. We cut lots of coherence activity. We have get a simpler coherence protocol, but what we're gonna talk about now is the flexibility you get, get from these optimizations. We're gonna talk about flexibility in, in three different aspects. One is where you place your data um, um, vertically, in which cache level you install the data. Then we're gonna talk about different topologies you can build with this, and then we're gonna talk about where you place the data horizontally between the different cores. So first of all, uh, the vertical data placement is quite simple. So uh, the cache coherence, uh, the metadata uh, cache hierarchy is an inclusive cache hierarchy. So if, um, that you see the, the yellow dots uh, have to exist in, if a yellow dot exists in the uh, cache closest to the core, it must also exist at the second level, third level, and, fourth, and so on. So it's an inclusive cache hierarchy with force inclusion. While the data storage is not inclusive. There's nothing that says that if you have data stored in, in L1, that that data also has to be installed in L2 and also has to be installed in, installed in LLC. So we have lots of freedom. So we have the flexibility I talked about. What can you do about that? If you have the flexibility where you can store the data, um, and that's the important flexibility because this blue SRAM is like 97% of all the data storage and the metadata hierarchy where you do have inclusion is just 3%. So if we waste a little bit of uh, space, there, that's, that is not that important. Um, so 
We did, did a study. In this study, we assumed you had a four-level cache hierarchy. And we looked at what fraction of the cache lines installed at each level is ever reused before that piece of data is thrown out of the cache. And these are pretty scary numbers. So at all these four levels, none of them have a reuse which is higher than 50%. And at, at L2, you can see the reuse is just 15%. 15% of all cache lines installed is ever used. This is pretty embarrassing. Um, so what we did was to come up with a heuristics, and exactly the heuristics we, we did is not important. I'm sure that any of you can you know, design any kind of heuristics that will do better than the default. Flexibility allowed us to, uh, to add heuristics. What we did is that we had a way to categorize regions. And uh, so we, told, we could categorize regions so that we know that all, all the regions of the same data set uh, could be identified. And then we assigned some learning cache lines. And then what we did, we installed those cache lines. 1% of the cache lines are installed everywhere. They're learning cache lines. We know what the data sets they belong to. And then we figure out at replacement, has this, has this been reused or not? Just a single bit, I have been reused. We just assess that bit. Uh, and then we can see that for this data structure here, well, it doesn't look that smart to install it in L1 or in L3. So that means that 99% of the access which uh, of the cache lines which are, which are not learning cache lines of the same data structure are going to be installed in L0 and L2. That's the policy we come up with. Uh, and then we bypass the other cache levels. And this it gives a, we pretty much double uh, the, the data reuse at all the, uh, all the levels. So that's good. We have much fewer cache install installations of cache lines into caches, and that's good for energy. Installing a cache line is, is an expensive hobby. So we don't want to install cache lines if we're pretty sure they're not going to get reused. So the net effect here is we had 28% lower dynamic energy, and the traffic uh, was lowered as much as 60%, between 20 and 60%, depending on which, which cache level we are talking about. OK, so that's flexibility in this, in this dimension, and one heuristics that can that can tell you what would be a good uh, strategy for installing the data. I'm going to talk about flexibility at the horizontal level now instead. So what I'm showing you here is a traditional um, three-level cache hierarchy where you have a uh, you have an L uh, last level cache on the other side of the NOC network on chip. Um, we call this far side LLC because. It's slow, that's the, that's the negative side of this. We have to jump, jump over the NOC to get to LLC, and then we have to jump with the data back across the NOC, so that it adds latency and energy. So it's slow and high, high energy consuming. But it has that shared last level cache has also two very nice properties. It's uh, you only store one copy of each cache line. So if you have a shared cache line that's very popular in the system, you don't have to waste lots of space and store it everywhere. It's just gonna be stored in a single copy in LLC, okay? And that means, also means that you can have shared cache capacities. So as this picture shows, uh, it looks like the red processor has high demand for caches than the blue processor. That means that the red processor will get, get more than half of the LLC because that, that's the best way to, to deal with the resources right now. So that's also a good thing. On the other hand, the private caches, such as the L2, has different features. First of all, they are fast because they are on the near side of the, of the network on chip. We don't have to jump across that slow network to get to the data. But the drawback is that shared data now has to be, have multiple copies. Uh, so we can co consume lots of different, more cache capacity uh, to store the, the, the shared data. And, and also the cache capacity is private. L2, if the blue processor doesn't need so much L2 cache, it cannot easily be used by, by the red processor, which was the, the case for the last level cache. What we're gonna do now is, you know, do a little magic, and we're gonna reorganize this topology. First of all, that far side LLC, we're gonna to move to the near side. Okay, so now I moved it to the near side and I just adjusted the pointers. So half of it sits to the left and half of it sits to the right. The pointers of the red processor can, can still point either to the left side or the right side. So it's going either point to its near side LLC or to the, its remote LLC in another node. Okay, um, and you know, we have all this private capacity, SRAM capacity, so we're gonna throw away the L2. The L2 doesn't make a make lot of sense since we added that giant last level cache there. So near side LLC is moved to the other side of the core, moved closer to the core, so the other side of the net network on chip. And we get the best of worlds. So we can um, have a local access time to our slice of the LLC, uh, so that's very similar to private L2. But you can also access the remote LLC 
with the same latency as you had before, two hops across the network, there and back, okay? Um, so this is some, some sense is, is similar to a non-uniform cache architecture. Um, it's, it's been um, described in literature for at least the last 18 years, but the difference here is that unlike traditional uh, NUCA architectures, non-uniform cache architectures, we don't need any extra tag searches to implement this. We have pointers. Our pointers can point to remote LLC way too, okay? And that means that we know exactly where, where it's going to be. If you implemented this using traditional tags, then you have to search the tags of your old LLC and to search the tags of the remote LLC, and that would not scale very well. Okay, so this is, this is actually, actually quite neat. So now, once more, we have flexibility, we have a new architecture, and actually I claim this is not a very hierarchical architecture. So the cache hierarchy is not hierarchical anymore, it's just completely flat. Um, but there's something wrong with this picture. Uh, we have lots of the red data is actually stored in the LLC of the blue processor and, and vice versa. It would be much ni nicer if we, given this flexibility, can come up with a kind of heuristics that allow us to place the data in a much smarter way. So that's what this picture shows. So the red processor will here now use all its local LLC, but since it's used, needed some more uh, capacity than the blue processor, it's also gonna mooch in and steal a little of, of the capacity on, on the other side. And then you have a little bit of shared memory probably stored on, on the blue side as well. And then you have the pure, pure blue data. So how did we get here? Well, we, we implemented a placement policy that promotes this kind of, of data implementation. So this, once more, is a, heuristics is a very simple heuristics. I'm sure machine learning can come up with much smarter algorithms, but this is good enough for us just to, just to prove the point. Um, so the simple uh, heuristics that we have here is, as a default, we only have one copy of each cache line just like we did before. We don't replicate cache lines left and right because that means we would lose lots of capacity. But we are, we are biased towards doing a first touch placement. So uh, the, the cache lines that are first touched by the red processor will, are more likely to be placed in the red L, uh, near side LLC. And only if there is a cache pressure that tells us that, that we now would then have to, have to move chain and steal some capacity on the other side, we will do, do so. So that's good. Then we improve this uh, algorithm a little bit by saying that actually some data we do want to replicate because you know, hot data that is actively used by both the blue and the red processor, why don't we have a copy on both sides? So we have one such piece of data, both, both the red and the blue are pointing to the same piece of data. So what we can do in our design is to actually create a, a replicated copy on the red side while we keep the, the blue copy on the blue side, so now we have replicated data. So it, now it looks, looks and feels much more like just a normal uh, L2 cache, but it's giant. So we did that for hot data and also for instructions because other water processors suffer much more from an instruction cache miss than from a data cache miss. So let's waste a little more uh, space, space and capacity on, on that. Uh, so we get best, best of both, both worlds now. We have a giant L2 cache. Well, we don't call it L2, we call it near side LLC that sits close to the core. Uh, and we can replicate hot data and instructions there. And we still have a giant common last level cache where some of it happens to be sitting close to us and part of it happens to be sitting far away uh, for large and shared data set and where we don't replicate uh, any data at all. And given this very, very simple heuristics, we actually get, at, at the end of the day, over a large number of benchmarks, we get 80% of our uh, accesses to the last level cache to the near side LLC and not to the far side. And this is for a, a four core system, so it's, if, you know, um, if, if just, you know, randomly, if you just had randomly placed data, we would get 25% instead we get 80%, and that is quite, quite a big, big boost for performance and energy. And for the remaining 20%, we haven't paid any extra because it's still two hops away. So how did we get there? Well, we have, we have new metadata, metadata cache line pointers. Um, we don't have to have hierarchical searches. We have pointers. That's also in, something which enabled this. Uh, we have a flexible topology, there's also something that enables this, and then we add the heuristics and we get the benefit from both. Okay, so finally, how, how good is this? Uh, so I'm taking you some results from a, this publication we did last year in HPCA, but I also, also want, want to iterate once more. We have done similar studies together with the industry, so this is not just something that, that we boil together in academia, it, it really seems, seems to be work fairly well. Uh, I'm gonna compare three different architectures. The one to the left is the baseline. It's a two-level mobile processor, the way they typically look in, in your 
in your smartphones today. Uh, four cores, uh, each core has an L1 cache, 32 kilobytes, eight-way set associated cache, and then it has a network on chip, and on the other side of the network on chip uh, sits the last level cache, which is four megabytes large. This is sort of like an ARM A A57 kind of architecture, so fairly aggressive uh, core. Um, and then to the right, we have the green cache. Um, so the green cache uh, is, has the same size L1 cache, and the, the total uh, size of its last, last level cache is also four megabytes, only that we have moved them to the other side of the interconnect. So now we have four, four uh, near side last level caches, one per core, just sitting on the other side. And the, the, the point here is this is exactly the same hardware cost, so it's area neutral designs. Apples and apples. And in the middle, we added one more design point just to see what would happen if you actually did add a local L2 cache to, to that uh, mobile processor. So this is a base 3L, three levels, uh, more like what Intel's processor would, would, would uh, look like today. So we added a total of one megabyte extra L2 capacity there. So it's, it's a higher, more expensive cost. It's a higher hardware cost. So let's see how these compare. Uh, and they also have another couple of, of configurations that I'm not going to talk about here. So, you know, looking at blue, green, and, and, and purple uh, in, in the results. Uh, as all good researchers, we have, you know, simulated ourselves to death across a large number of benchmarks. So let me just talk about the benchmarks. We have parallel Parsec benchmarks. We have the Splash, which we, Splash 2X, which we called like something more similar to HPC. Benchmarks we worked a lot with, with, um, commercial vendors that build smartphones. Therefore, they were interested in how we performed of, of mobile browsers. So this is the mobile Chrome browser. Um, uh, server mix, and we have databases, and then we have uh, the average geo mean over there. Um, and the first study we did was we looked at the number of network, uh, network on chip transactions. Uh, so this is the number of network on chip transactions for 1,000 instructions, so lower is better. Uh, and we're not gonna look at all the benchmarks, we're just gonna look at the geo mean. Um, and here you can see that the uh, two-level baseline comes up to 60 shishkime bobs or whatever that unit could be. Um, and then if you add the extra L2 cache, more hardware, you actually, of course, you filter some traffic, so, so less traffic across the network on chip, uh, but we actually filter much more. So even though, though our implementation is, is much cheaper, uh, we re remove 70% fewer messages, and if you actually count the number of bits we transfer across there, uh, because some messages are, are, are smaller than others, then we are, are reducing the amount of bits moved by 65%. So that, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, um, if you look at uh, dynamic energy, and once more just zoom in on, on, the, um, um, uh, on the average means, you see the, the, the mobile two level has you know, hundreds of shishkime bobs, any delay products is this unit here. Uh, the, the three level has maybe less than 80 shishkime bobs and we actually count the any delay product by, by more than 50%. Uh, uh, this, these numbers are based on sort of academic assumptions of, of, about power consumption, but this has also been verified in, in commercial settings that there is, there is a uh, energy savings on, on, on par with this. Uh, so finally, performance, so speed up. How much speed up do we have over, over the mobile processor, the two-level mobile processor? Um, so here in our simulator, we actually don't, uh, we don't model network contention. We don't model contention in the network or chip, as you heard from, from Pair and, and from others here as well. Uh, traffic, uh, the contention for, for network resources could be very, very important for performance. And I already told you we are saving 70% of those transactions. So clearly we would have an upside that we are, is not taken into account in these numbers. Um, so what you can see here uh, on average, we, we cut the L1, uh, the L1 miss latency by 30%, uh, pretty drastic. Uh, that it translates to an 8% faster execution because out of order processors are good at hiding latency. So if you cut latency, then the processor can get even better at hiding latency, and also so they, they can they can potentially take away some of your fun here. But eight percent is a very respectable number. Twenty eight percent for database benchmarks, uh, and as I said, we are cutting the L one miss latency by uh, by thirty percent. Okay, other potential usage usage areas. So first of all, let's just count up the bits. How how did we get to five bits for one of these pointers? Well, you have to have to be able to point to every location that a master copy could be. 
which means the number of cache levels you have plus their associativity, it times their associativity is the number of places you have to be able to point to, right? That's quite clear. And then if the, if the data resided in, in the private cache of another core, we just pointed to that core, so we just have to add the number of cores here. So in the system I showed you, three level cache hierarchy, four cores, um, eight way associative caches, uh, that's how you come up to five bits log, uh, so it's log, two log of, of 28. Okay, so just remember that when I talk about these different other usage areas. So one u potential usage area is, is to help pair implement his fantastic compression algorithm. So let's say that he has a compression algorithm that can have a compression factor of four in his caches. We have compressed data in caches. That means he can store four times as much data in those caches. But it also means that there are four more places where data can reside in the caches. And the more compression you have, the more things you have to identify. And typically we implement compressed caches by duplicating tags. So you have four times the number of tags you need for uncompressed data, and then you, on a good day you're using it all, on a bad day that, that's just wasted hardware. In our case, we just have to be able to point to four times more locations. So that means that we just need to add two more bits. Four times more locations, okay? So that's, that's not super, super expensive. Um, then. then, of course, we have to be friends with Pear to make sure we can, can borrow his, 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 uh, his algorithm because we're not, not working on that at all. What about accelerators? So accelerators, uh, so lots, of, lots of talk about accelerators here as well, during the multi-core day. Uh, typically, an accelerator has some kind of scratch pad that sits close to the accelerator because you know, it's, it's really good at you know, multiplying numbers or whatever it's good at and needs data at a high rate. So it needs lots of capacity close to it. And typically, that's implemented as a scratch pad memory, just normal memory. It's private memory that only it can use, only it understands, uh, but it's not coherent. So from a software productivity point of view, it could be very complicated to manage that, that, those kind of resources. What we're saying here is that, well, if you have an accelerator, that scratch pad can be turned into memory as long as the rest of the world can point into it. So that means that in some sense we have, adding one accelerator means we add just one core. And the, the overhead, the cache clamp pointer size is logarithmic to the number of cores. So if you, you know, add, you know, if, if you just add one, it's not gonna cost anything because we had little wiggle room here in 28, uh, but after that it's gonna cost log, log n to do that. Uh, another thing about accelerators is that accelerators typically access private data. Only the accelerator will do the matrix, sparse matrix multiplication of, of this structure here, and nobody else will touch that matrix multiplication at this point in time, so it's private data. So that means it's gonna get classified 99 0.9% of the cases, at least the GPU workloads that we've been looking into, uh, it's almost, almost all of it is private data. So it's a coherent cache, but it doesn't cost anything because when it's private data, you get read access, you get write access without communicating that to any kind of directory. So that's pretty neat. And finally, also touching to what Pat talked about, DRAM caches. So if you like, like to implement a DRAM cache, well, you don't need to implement, DRAM caches are huge, right? That means your address tags also has to be huge to cover all those, all those cache lines. In our case, no, you don't have to have that. All you have to give, to, to, you have introduced a method for your cache line pointers to point into the DRAM cache, which means you have to add one level in that, in that uh, um, equation up here. So that means in our case that adding a DRAM cache means that our cache line pointers would be six bits in, instead of five bits. And we have done some uh, evaluation in commercial settings here on GPU, uh, GPU, uh, GPUs in combination with DRAM caches and show that we can actually double, uh, about double the bit, uh, the frame rate of using the same hardware. Uh, assuming a bandwidth limited design, um, DRAM then limited design, so we have introduced a DRAM cache with the EDRAM and we doubled the, the bandwidth and cut the energy about in half as well. Okay, so just to sum up, um, optimization for the cache hierarchy. Actually, I should have put cache hierarchy in parentheses because it's not a hierarchy anymore. If for the cache blob, uh, you need first of all flexibility and some heuristics. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to do any optimizations. We talked about the organization of the metadata, the reading classification, and the coherence of the determinants. Uh, we talked about some heuristics. Uh, just two examples, one horizontal and one vertical uh, way to optimize where data is being placed. Uh, we saw that um, just implementing the virtual optimization because in the HPCA study we didn't 
do anything of the horizontal, uh, or, or the, or the, just the horizontal optimization was, was all we did in the HPCA paper. We didn't take any, any other benefit from the vertical. Um, we saw a 70% uh, cut in traffic, more than 50% en energy drop, and 30% faster ergon misses. And then we looked at uh, different usage areas, compression accelerators, and DRMs. And there are lots, lots, lots more areas uh, that come for free. Things we didn't think of once we started this work that have you know, uh, been, uh, they've been discovered ourselves or by other people, by questions we've got from, from industry, not the least, if we can build certain kind of systems. Uh, it's been um, a very interesting trip. So with that, I end my talk. <laughs>